I sometimes laugh when people compare everything they don't like to Nazi Germany or Stalin or whatever other dictatorship they can think of off the top of their heads. But maybe I shouldn't laugh because I used the book 1984 for the same purpose. George Orwell's 1984 is one of several books that's regularly alluded to by people who've never read it. We've gained so many useful words from it, like Orwellian, Big Brother, Thought Police, Double Think, and so on, and yet people often use those words wrongly. They talk about similarities between our world and 1984, but most of the comparisons I've heard are very flimsy. And it's clear 1984 is just being invoked because it's the best-known work of dystopian sci-fi. It's one of my favorite books ever, and if you say that means I have no taste in fiction, well, you're probably right. In this three-part series, I'm going to see in what ways the world of today resembles the world depicted in 1984. You don't have to have read the book to understand this series, but you should read it anyway. Just before we start today, let's recognize this week's sponsor, Victory Gin! <coughs> Part 1. Big Brother. First, I should say, obviously, we aren't living in the totalitarian nightmare of 1984 in every respect. In 1984, the people, or at least the people we know about, members of the party, are completely divided. You don't have friends or private loyalties, just fellow slaves to the state. You can't have private time or private meetings or private anything. You can't have love except love for Big Brother. You can't have joy other than the joy of destroying an enemy of the state. In 1984, your every word and expression and move is scrutinized to see if you're committing thought crime. I don't know of anywhere like that. All states impose a social system on people, force them to work, divide them, and indoctrinate them to hate someone else, but none have ever quite approximated the world of 1984. Like other dystopian sci-fi, 1984 was a warning about what could happen. Nowadays, people love drawing comparisons between the book and the world today. Unfortunately, most of those comparisons seem to be exaggerated for rhetorical purposes. Someone tell capitalist creations, taxes on gas and cigarettes don't mean our world resembles that of a terrifying work of science fiction. So to answer the question posed in the title of this video, no. Let's take a second to appreciate that. <sighs> but let's see if there are some ways we can compare life in 1984 to life in whatever year this is without exaggerating. The best books are those that tell you what you know already. Perhaps the most obvious parallels we can draw between the world of the book and our world is the state is always watching you. In 1984, our first glimpse at Big Brother is of a poster of him. It depicted simply an enormous face, more than a meter wide, the face of a man of about 45 with a heavy black mustache and ruggedly handsome features. Big Brother, the figurehead of the party that controls the continent of Oceania, looks down from every wall, watching every member of the party, and as such it's a metonym for the party enforcement apparatus, like surveillance and the thought police, which is why we use it that way today. The posters themselves are not spying devices, just there to remind you of all the spying, and to keep you scared. The purpose of surveillance in the book is clear, to enforce complete conformity to the word of the party, in thought and behavior. Conformity to party doctrine or 
orthodoxy meant controlling everything from your face. He had set his features into the expression of quiet optimism which it was advisable to wear when facing the telescreen. To your very thoughts, in case they betray you. It was terribly dangerous to let your thoughts wander when you were in any public place or within range of a telescreen. They instill enough fear in party members that they know there's no point in thinking an unorthodox thought. There's no chance of challenging Big Brother. The philosopher Jeremy Bentham designed a prison he called the Panopticon, enabling the guards to look at any prisoner at any time. They may or may not be watching, but the constant threat that they could be would force prisoners to behave. In 1984, the whole society is turned into a panopticon. They have patrols everywhere looking for suspicious behavior, including helicopters looking into windows. They have telescreens, which are like a 24-hour Zoom conversation with the government. And most terrifyingly, they have secret police, known as the Thought Police. Winston reflects, it was even conceivable that they watched everybody, all the time. His suspicions are confirmed for us one day when he's supposed to be joining in with everyone in aerobics. He lets his attention wander, and the instructor shouts at him, Smith! 6079 Smith W! Yes, you. Bend lower, please. You can do better than that. You're not trying. Lower, please. That's better, comrade. In our time, too, we live in a panopticon. We know from the revelations of Edward Snowden and other whistleblowers that the state could always be watching you. For decades now, CCTV cameras have been going up in public places, so we're being filmed most of the places we go. Facial recognition software means they can identify you. We carry devices around with us that tell the government where we are and what we're saying to our friends. And in many homes, those devices are linked to all the other appliances. Do you know about PRISM? The government uses it to find out anything it wants about you. Do you know about the DCSN? The FBI uses it to tap into any phone they want. Do you know about Pegasus? Governments use it to target journalists, like Jamal Khashoggi. Pretty much any kind of electronic footprint you leave, the state can track you down. They can use security cameras and drones and tracking devices, or just your phone, to know where you go. We even pay to bug our own homes. They, the bugs have jovial female voices, so they sound harmless. Even though it's been revealed, people listen to us through them, too. In countries like China, of course, it's even worse. And everything is increasingly being turned into data to strengthen corporate control of our lives even further. If you try to reveal any government or corporate operations, you'll get charged as a Eurasian spy and millions of indoctrinated civilians will call you a traitor for revealing to them how they're being duped and spied on. It's easier to live in ignorance, after all. But is the purpose the same? Are our rulers spying on us in order to intimidate us? I don't know. But all states, however many external enemies they have, their main enemy, the one most capable of overthrowing them is their domestic population, their citizenry. So it's at them they direct the bulk of their propaganda. I use the word propaganda specifically. Propaganda is not political messages you disagree with. Propaganda means the messages the ruling class uses to indoctrinate its subjects. It's the beliefs and assumptions the people at the top of the social hierarchy instill in their people to keep them going to work instead of rebelling. It surrounds us our whole lives, unless at some point we learn to question it. And as Jacques Ellul says in his book on the topic, the aim of all propaganda is to make the individual conform to the social system. 
The ubiquitous posters of Big Brother contrast with today's world, but not entirely. In 1984, we get the impression the image of Big Brother is the only picture on any wall. Obviously, our walls are adorned with an apparently wide variety of messages. This superficial diversity, this expression of multitude, couldn't possibly exist in a world of total conformity like 1984, or Equilibrium, or uh, the one where Robert Duvall shaves his head, or any of my favorite sci-fi. But if you look a bit closer, you'll see most of the ads on most of the walls or screens, at least the ones that get any attention, are just trying to get your money. Or else maybe your allegiance. All these ads look a little different, but they all have more or less the same purpose, to sell you the system. Most of them try to get you to spend money on things you don't need. In fact, if you want to get dystopian, one of the biggest, most powerful corporations, owned by one of the richest, most powerful men, has a smile in its logo. And Amazon's not the only one. Big Brother watches you to remind you to keep in line. Amazon smiles because you're giving it all your money. Some ads sell you allegiance to the nation state. Others sell you the opportunity to ease your guilt about being a consumer. Each of them attempts to mold your thinking somewhat. All successful salespeople have to change others' minds. In 1984, creative people are all working at the Ministry of Truth, where they write stories that reflect the values of the party. In our time, they work in PR departments and advertising agencies, writing the stories we come to believe. They tell us what we're supposed to look like, including how much we're supposed to weigh. They teach us gender roles. They tell us how a family is supposed to act. They tell us we're all part of the same community, the nation. They tell us we have to have the best of everything, regardless of what it costs, and the best always comes from the brand whose ads have the highest production value. Every ad, along with mass media more generally, paints a little part of a bigger picture of what's normal, our reality. You don't have to see something accurately to think it's normal. You may just believe what everyone else believes because we all consume similar media without asking a lot of questions about how accurately it re represents the world. Members of the party in 1984 felt normal. They went through much the same indoctrination we did, school, mass media, the workplace, each one assuring us everything is the way it's supposed to be. The right people are in charge of a system that works for the people, and we have to let them stay there, or the foreign enemy, whose social system is indistinguishable, might take over. Orwell might have predicted the use of the study of the human mind to manipulate people. Psychology has always been used by governments and marketers to make their PR. It was already happening in Orwell's time, as we know from Edward Bernays. But the study of psychology has become central to propaganda since then. Language, of course, is essential to propaganda itself. In 1984, a whole appendix is devoted to explaining how the language the party is crafting, newspeak, reduces the number of words available to the speaker and destroys all connotations and shades of meaning. So language can only be used to express an opinion acceptable to Big Brother. The idea was to reduce everyone's potential range of thought. The finished version of Newspeak would make it impossible to think an unorthodox thought. For us, language is still manipulated, as you're probably aware. In fact, Orwell wrote an essay on that, too. Words are carefully selected to have the right impact, however deceptive they might be. If the people who own or influence the media want you to get angry about something, they'll use words that get you angry. Propaganda is full of words that appeal to our sense of fear or purpose, or both simultaneously. 
Sometimes the meanings of words are reversed or distorted out of recognition. I don't really mind when it's a word like literally, which now apparently also means not literally. It's a little confusing, but I'll manage. But I might object when people use the word freedom to describe everything from invading and occupying foreign land and killing a million people to baking. In both cases, and probably most in between, these people are being manipulated into conflating freedom, supposedly a virtue, with whatever the propaganda wants them to buy, from support for a war to pig fat. The word freedom now means little or nothing to the people who use it most. People assume they're free because they've been told they are their whole lives and given foreign countries to compare with and things aren't as bad over there as they are here, so we must be free and we'll, we'll stay free, whatever the state tells us to do. Look at that Lee Greenwood song you've probably heard if you're American. How he says, I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. Hmm? You know? Think how brainwashed you need to be to say a line like that. He's free simply by dint of his nationality. The flag stands for freedom and they can't take that away. What? They can't? So what's with all the laws and prisons? Lee Greenwood, along with millions more Americans, seem to believe no matter what happens, if you're American and you have a flag, you're free. We could go on about the manipulation of language all day, but if you've read about propaganda or just listened to George Carlin, you already know about it. Either way, when you're listening to someone's carefully planned words, ask yourself why they chose those words. In our world, there are some signs the system's monopoly on information has crumbled, and the propaganda might not be on firm ground as it once was. Thanks to the internet, we can easily challenge the system's claims. The problem is, we still have to unlearn what it's taught us. We can identify every lie of every politician, but until we realize we don't need politicians making decisions for us, we will continue to believe in them. We have to learn to see things as integrated systems, not isolated institutions or events. We have to realize our enemy is the system itself, not foreigners or subversives. And if we want to fight it, we have to leave our atomized state and organize with others. Now, unlike in 1984, you won't get arrested and tortured for having the wrong ideas or facial expression. However, it shouldn't disturb you to know that you're being listened to, or could be being listened to all the time, and law enforcement could be making a file on you. There's always a crime out there the government could use to build a case against you and arrest you if it wants. Most of us commit crimes every day. Yet we also complacently take for granted the state, along with a variety of corporations, could be listening to us and reading whatever we write through our devices. We don't face the same restrictions on behavior they do in 1984, but if we want to do anything the state has decided is criminal or subversive, it can label us terrorists and traitors and lock us up indefinitely without trial. Without even talking about those laws, think how powerful the labels they use are. If the media call you a terrorist, a traitor, an insurgent, or something similar, the public will call for your execution. You know, as if you were a Eurasian spy. Today there are no thought police, but you might get surveilled and harassed. The US government has made it quite clear it will be targeting extremists. The word, of course, means nothing. 
If it had a definition, you could always explain why it didn't apply to you. But instead, it's just everyone whose views fall outside the mainstream. The words sound scary, because like the words terrorist and insurgent and criminal, it's used to trick people into fearing others and wanting the state to hurt them. The average citizen rejects anything considered extreme out of hand because they don't question what they hear. They've been trained not to listen to you. They've been taught to believe in the status quo and to give all kinds of reasons in support of it. They're good citizens. They reject everything that falls outside the limits of acceptable discourse, as set by other people. Like in 1984 and other dictatorships, you need to be careful what you say, even today. Because civilians are willing to sell each other out for a pat on the head from authority. The cop is informed someone broke the law, so they go get them and throw them in a cage. The soldier hears someone is an extremist or a terrorist who threatens the freedom of their people, and then goes to kill them without further questions. We don't have thought crime or thought police, but we do have people who will kill you because someone told them you pose a threat to an intangible value. That's why Winston says a couple of times in the book, we are the dead. He knows he's a thought criminal and that the bullet could come at any time. Malcolm X would have understood. The price of freedom is death. If you fight back, or in many parts of the world, if you just say the wrong things, you could be the state's next target. States want stability, their stability. They impose their order, which benefits the rich and powerful, and any challenges to that order are destroyed as quickly as possible. The state in 1984 demands total conformity. The state in our time accepts some difference of opinion, but not if it's practiced. You can think whatever you want. You're just not allowed to do it without going to jail. The state and other forces of power and propaganda are still extremely influential. They plan out our lives for us and punish us for deviating. They spy on us everywhere we go, or at least they can. In fact, they're getting stronger one edict, one program, one agency at a time, which weakens us as individuals. But we too can organize, and in greater numbers. That's how we'll prevent the final victory of Big Brother.